So uh, Ryan Ergobel is uh, the last, and of course not the least speaker. So he is going to uh, entertain us about again about this uh, course talk. His uh, training is uh, neuroscience and engineering, uh, both in the uh, University of Marburg in Braunschweig and uh, Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got several awards. Uh, big names, Leibniz Award, and this type of very big names for award. And uh, he's going to to introduce us to um, <coughs> this issue of uh, the oh. interaction between the two. Uh, <laughs> so you, you got it, yeah. yeah. Visual cortex and MRI. Uh, so very very connected to the talk by Brian, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I have one slide for Brian. Yeah, I first want to thank the organizers and also Amir, who I think had first contact. Um, to be here today, and I want to um, use the opportunity to try to present to you uh, some work which might be very relevant for studying plasticity in the future. So I, I, I must disappoint you, I will not show any slide of uh, plasticity. We do some work, but I have decided not to present that because um, what I want is to lay the foundation for future plasticity. We have one experiment running, but um, it's too early to say something. So the main idea of this presentation is to look a bit more with higher resolution into the brain concerning human, um, human brains, uh, living human brains, so that we can maybe find some uh, organizations and some, some measurements which help us to kind of understand the brain better in terms of uh, connectivity in a more um, uh, laminar sense and also m which helps us to understand cognitive phenomena be better and in the tangential sense to understand better what features are coded within the areas because if we can map these features we can then also look how they change when you get exposed to certain specific new stimuli that's actually what we try to do at the moment so for plasticity a bit too early but I hope still that you see <coughs> the the value of this presentation. So I will first start to um, explain a bit what I mean by that, and I will use the term maybe during my talk a lot called mesoscopic fMRI. That's what we, we use, and that means that we push the resolution of fMRI away from areas and networks down to things within the cortex, within a special area. For example, that we resolve the layers of the cortex, of course not um, shiny, nice like in animal research with six layers and sublayers, but very coarse, usually in like three compartments. But you will see that this still can help us to understand phenomena much better. And secondly, um, along the cortex, so that we look with submillimeter imaging what's happening inside brain areas and can we understand the coding principles better within these areas. And uh, um, I will then mention high field imaging, which basically is important because it is not what some people expect, just giving you the same, but just a bit more signal or so. But my argument is that if this push to high field imaging gives us a bit more resolution, we see suddenly completely different organization of the brain. So it's a qualitative change by pushing the spatial resolution of fMRI. After saying a few words about this and attempts to go there, I will then go more to results. I will show you how we developed and, and show data, how we mapped certain features uh, in the visual cortex, extrastriate visual cortex. And then I will go to more perceptual phenomena, like showing you that if you understand these features better, we can better understand phenomena like perceptual switches. Actually, I would even go so far that we get a new way of have neural correlates of consciousness, which I will show you later on. Uh, up to phenomena like attention, like, like expectations, like predictive coding, these things become much more meaningful at that resolution um, which we try to attempt. And at the end, I give you also one practical application. This, uh, I would like to show you some of our very recently started um, plasticity work, but it's too early. But I show another example where, where these kind of insights you get already lead to practical implications. So first, what do I mean when I say that? I view the brain uh, as also being involved in the Human Brain Project. I see the brain as something which is organized at multiple scales, right? And of course, this is a natural thing because we have uh, molecules, we have uh, neurons, we have uh, uh, circuits, we have uh, areas, we have uh, system level uh, areas which are connected and form networks and so on. So this is a quite natural thing. And I think that especially um, cognitive psychology, experimental psychology, uh, have benefited dramatically by um, uh, human fMRI because 
they opened up the so-called black boxes, which were usually done when I was a student in psychology, just before fMRI came, actually. Um, 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 uh, yeah, we, we draw all these boxes, did reaction time experiments, try to infer what's going on, and you can come pretty far, but at some point you, you, you cannot decide on theories and so on. So I think to open up these boxes and seeing now the areas, the networks, what activity is in these boxes, how they are connected, uh, a lot like we have seen before by Brian and others, that's, that's remarkable because it has helped us to understand the system level of the brain much better. And we can study both the representations but also the interactions between regions at that level. And what I want to, and we need that. Multiscale means no level is unimportant. All are important. So if I now say something, what I want to do, this doesn't mean that I don't like that. Actually, the opposite. This is a very important uh, insight and tool we have. But what I want to stress in this talk, and it's actually the heart of my current research, is to push the limits and go inside these boxes, which is indicated by these colorful circles, which, which should indicate you see somehow not only how active is this area, Say you show faces and you say the face area is more active, if faces look more cartoonistic or look more like upside down, then you study how much amplitude you get in one area. So it's one dependent variable, the average response there. This is typically how papers are in cognitive neuroscience. Um, and if we can change that and can zoom in and suddenly see features, suddenly see, okay, this face has this pattern over mapped features which we understand we might be able to construct completely new phases because we then see distributed activity over the mapped features, understood features, and can then much more precisely predict what would be the percept uh, behind. This is the logic. It tries to bridge um, uh, cognitive neuroimaging more with like um, animal research, but not at the neuronal level, but more at the mesoscopic level, which in our hands, um, we mean by that um, um, uh, columnar-like clusters, not typical columns, but columnar-like clusters, I show you a lot of them, and, and, and laminal uh, separations to some extent. And that will help us not only to understand like alphabets, like, like Keiji Tanaka has done in the macaque monkey a lot, but also uh, um, understands how these features interact at the mesoscopic level. So for example, if I have a, 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 a voxel in the visual, I learned the visual we should drop, the word form area, right? And I see, ah, there is a line conjunction from these two lines somewhere here, say it's the basis of forming the letter T, an important part of it. Can I find from these voxels which respond to this line junction, can I find an earlier visual cortex, uh, retinotopically, horizontal vertical lines which kind of drive this kind of stimulus there? So can we tag to the connectivity, resolution, and features? That's the important point. I know we are not yet there, but the work I show you today, I think, makes a good step in this direction. And if you understand these features, we can also try to look how these features change. For example, we do now the study, now I tell you what it is. We, do, we re replicate these Gautier studies with Griebels, but we use also cars, so we make car experts. But we now have mapped some face features and now want to see whether, for example, the features coding the eyes get innervated by the front view with the lamps of a car. So whether we can not only see that FFA is invaded by other stimuli if you have a high demanding learning task, but also how featural correspondences you can do from objects you learn to, to already known features. So these are the kind of experiments I envision which will come much more in the future. So what did we do to go there? Our early attempts were basically, with, when Nico Kriegeskorte was still in my lab, uh, we, we, we said, let's map the features, this was 3T days, 3 Tesla days, so we, we, we said we cannot resolve these features, but maybe we can have a small spotlight, which we run through the brain, and the spotlight looks multivariately, whether it has the sensitivity to separate features in the brain area. For example, horizontal, vertical, which you do like in the visual cortex easily with um, the work from Kamitani Tong and so on. But this looked more for what's happening within the size of a sphere, which we let run around, uh, of a typical brain area. So it was really made to try to look with, within brain areas. So it was already inspired by these ideas I just mentioned. And it has some success, but at the end of the day, you still have this information, there is some, some more, usually, uh, if you are lucky, more sensitive results from these classifiers, but on the other hand, you still don't map the features to voxels, you still don't can compositionality generalize to new stimuli because you can just look at the similarity of vectors uh, and not really of features. So therefore, it's a good approach, but it is uh, not enough for the purposes I have in mind. 
Another example, we, uh, um, um, we, we try to use um, classifiers in the, also in the auditory domain, so I'm switching sometimes back and forth to, to make points. And here we wanted to see whether we can not only uh, um, elucidate um, visual features, li like, like, like in this case really the letters, like the, the written uh, uh, vowels, A, O, E, U, and so on, but also um, um, uh, the acoustic version of this, so that we basically trained classifiers with different vowels, which I consider as features, not just that there is auditory cortex active or frequency, which we mapped before, but that we really can dis have distinctive clusters of information about the specific vowel you hear, not just that you hear something, and the specific speaker you hear, so who is talking to you, right? So these are all attempts to go in this direction to map these features, go inside the brain areas. And this worked pretty well, actually, but very distributed. So again, we couldn't map these AOU and speakers precisely on voxels, but we got the three Tesla quite nice prediction power to new speakers, actually, and new, new vowels, but it was um, a very distributed coding which we found. So therefore, um, uh, 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 um, what I want to show you today is to not solve it via classifiers, via machine learning, but to solve it by old-fashioned univariate statistics. So I go back to the non-hype, very, very simple methods now. And the idea is to, to exchange then this, the sensitivity of multivariate spatial patterns, to exchange that going really to the voxels, but making the resolution and the power you get from each voxel higher by going to ultra-high field. 7 Tesla, 9.4 Tesla. So we go very high in our lab with this. And the idea is very simple. So if we uh, have like the resolution is typically 2, 3 millimeter at 3 Tesla. So if we, this is too big. It's just the voxel is as big as the cortex, right? If you want to resolve the cortex, this is too big. Um, so, so basically, if we now push the resolution to sub-millimeter, between, say, 500 micron and one millimeter in that range, then we suddenly have enough voxels to put in depths of the cortex, and we have enough voxels, hopefully, to resolve some features as at the voxel level within the brain areas without pooling them in the multivariate way. So that's the idea. So this little bit in res resolution terms, in this multi-scale, you see there's the multi-scale. So for macro scale, which is accessible in non-invasive human imaging, uh, if we push it a bit to the right, we suddenly reach an, a, a level where we can see, in a rough way, uh, cortical layers and um, um, columnar-like features or clusters which have different featural preference. That's the point. It's not important how they look like. It's important that they have different featural preference. So, so and why is it maybe possible? Uh, because we are very lucky, again, that, that nature has not put the uh, neurons in a random order in the brain areas, but it forms these clusters in the ideal textbook way that look really like vertical columns across depths of cortex, right? Uh, uh, of course, if you go um, uh, even in Biban, but especially outside, you find clusters and columns, but they're not as nice as those. Tanaka had many papers showing that. So I'm also not claiming we will find these perfect clusters, but the, the principle is not to have columns because that's a very um, heatedly debated term at the moment. Um, I'm not into columns, it's just that some people know then what I'm talking about. The important point is that neurons of the same featural uh, uh, type cluster functionally together so that if we have a resolution which goes from like, like um, here, uh, which goes from, from, from like three Tesla voxels, they, if you pull here, you get an average and it's difficult to separate uh, uh, bi bi biases in one of these features. If you have columns, already multivariate should work better because if you have a, 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 a big voxel, from two, you have multiple features in, but maybe one feature is more prominent than the others and this will be picked up already by multivariate a pattern analysis for that voxel, a little bias, which is not significant in itself. But if you then shrink the voxels further, you suddenly get signals more and more driven by just one or maybe two of these columns, and then your voxels become meaningful in itself in their response, because they restrict their response to a sub-feature, sub-categorical feature. And that's uh, what we uh, want to achieve. Of course, this columnar concept, as you heard already before, from Stephen goes back to Hubel and Wiesel. I was very lucky recently to meet one of those. One is unfortunately dead since a few years. 
Um, and, and, and actually, I built my, my work a lot on, 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 on Hubel and Wiesel's work in the conceptual way that I exploit that we have these clusters, of course, which they originally detected with, pen, with vertical penetrations in the uh, V1. But of course, later on, it was also demonstrated with optical uh, imaging. You see these patterns, and you see then these for different uh, or oriented line elements. Uh, for, for tiny piece of the visual field, you find all different orientations, and then, then for different tiny parts of the visual field, you replicate this, and you basically um, fill out with a cortical magnification, and so on. It's much more complicated, and you have also others, other, uh, not only orientation, you have also blobs and whatever. So, so, but, but this is, the, for me, important idea, that because neurons cluster, and if we now get a resolution which comes close to this clustering, we might drive our voxels not by an average of many features, but more and more drive them by, by single features. So is that possible? The first paper which showed that could be done uh, uh, was by Isa Jakub and, and Camille Ugerbilt's group in Minneapolis, with whom actually I, we collaborate very intensively. So many, many of the work I show next uh, is uh, co-authored by these two groups, our group and their group. Uh, and, 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 and in this very f uh, uh, early work, uh, Isa Jakub, for a tiny patch on one slice, it was just one slice along the calcarine, a flat calcarine which they selected in their subjects, they could indeed see these different colors for the different orientations. So they, they got something in the human for a tiny piece of V1, which looked very similar like what you get with optical imaging in, in, the, in the macaque or on the cat. And, and that, for me, was um, uh, the final um, go signal. Uh, to apply for um, advanced ERC grant and so on and, and establish the lab with new scanners, ultra high field, because I think that is actually what, what we want to do and want to kind of dedicate much of our time in this kind of research. You see here, uh, the, the, this is another picture from the uh, figure from that study. Uh, they just measured this slice and they put it, here's the calcarine salsus, and they put it in one bank here in the lower bank, so they, they get the upper visual field. Uh, and also in one hemisphere, so, so part of, a tiny part of one quadrant. And that's what they imaged here, basically. Actually, you see it here. This is the imaging part that they really got data from. Uh, and now the point is, and we heard this from very nicely from Stephen, that a lot of the data is uh, buried in the folds, right? So, so what I wanted to do is to apply this, but not in a straight calcarine, but in any normally curved part of the brain, of the visual cortex first, and also auditory, multi-sensory cortex, I show you. So that's, that's the idea to extend that. So what we did then is to develop um, methods which basically allow us at the very same time to, to scan in depths and horizontally with a very high submillimeter resolution. And we developed also tools which looked like grids, almost like schematically shown here, which sample tangentially and in depths um, the cortical activation. Um, one approach which has been used more from, from Polymeni in, in, in Boston, uh, and we also use this, but, but it's not, not always sufficient for our purposes. One simple idea is we use the standard meshes as we all reconstruct them, like, like in Brian's lab, in our lab, in Boston, free server, whatever you have, and then basically move the, 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 the surface in depth. So for example, the blue is, is always the same surface, but the blue one runs at the peel surface, a little bit inside, tiny little bit, and then the more you go to these colors, the more you see this surface runs almost already at white matter because you see all the gray matter laterally around that surface. And you have all these surfaces, of course, at the same time. And you can sample the activity if, if your functional data is pretty nicely aligned, A and B, you sample the functional data from these different surfaces, you get some uh, uh, indication of what's going on in depths. And you sample, of course, laterally along the cortex, you get indication what's going on uh, uh, laterally. And the point is that in our case, um, with this ultra-high field, we use also special sequences, spin-echo-based sequences, GRACE is a spe special name, which cannot do whole brain anymore, especially not in that resolution. So we basically get almost like in animal experiments, electrophysiological ones, usually only like a tiny part of the brain. And then we put in, in this tiny part, um, a, a special uh, uh, surfaces which are mathematically precise because they, they follow a 2D regular grid in depth where each point is a, a co-register, co co as you see here, across depth. So we can analyze uh, like along depths, but also along the cortex in, in, in these kind of different depths levels. And that helps us to basically analyze the data afterwards in a very nice way because we, have, uh, we don't have to flatten things because these grids are flattened, 2D grids, just kind of morphed into the cortex and they help us to analyze the data. Here you see such a grid in one depth level and you see these patches now you see here, these are sampled from measured high-resolution data on these grids. 
And uh, uh, this shows you uh, uh, how we um, can, can analyze this. You see, we just measure this part of the brain, and these little green things are all tiny voxels. This is actually MT, MT plus, I should say. It's not precisely only MT, but it's the uh, uh, human V5 complex, MT complex. And you see that we see here these different colors. I will show you more later. They correspond to different uh, directions of motions, actually axes of motion. I will explain in a moment. So th these are uh, features within one area which separate here by this high-resolution brain imaging. And you can look at it in, in, in a volumetric way like this one, but it has been shown to be much nicer after we sample these different crits to show them actually uh, um, uh, here in the uh, um, uh, kind, of, kind of stacked way. That means we use the folded cortex, we have the depth information, and then we kind of put it back in the flattened crits in a 3D stack. So we have basically a flattened space where the, the, the layers from top is superficial layer and you go downward to the white matter, to the deep layer. So we can now have a new volume which we can analyze with all tools, including decoding when we still want to do that. So, but we have kind of extracted new volumes with functional data in this kind of space. And you see here when we make this transparent, we see these not perfectly, but, but, but roughly columnar-like structures here. Again, the two colors correspond to two different directions of motion, as I will show you in a moment. So this is the preparation we did. And to test it first, um, my idea was to go back to my, my first favorite fMRI experiment I ever did, which was done at the same time, even a bit earlier, by Roger Tutel and Seki and others. And what, I, what, I, what we did there, many people did at that time, we used m moving dots, like, like a Star Wars field, compared to static dots. And if the dots move, you see that in this lateral region, this V5 I mentioned before, uh, becomes active. You see it actually much nicer here. You see when, when, when you have motion, this error responds very strongly. But if you have static stimuli, you get a, a weak response. From, from the stimulus flicker, you might, might get also a response that's much weaker. Whereas in V1, it likes both stimuli very much. A bit more the motion, but also the static gets a, gets a beautiful response. So now what we want to do is, and we didn't even dare to ask at that time, can we not only, and that's the difference from the standard imaging to this high field imaging. The difference is the question. There we ask, can we see motion versus static in MT, to find MT as a motion selective area. Now the question is, can we distinguish motion in this direction from motion in that direction? Then we do something like looking in the features coded in this area. And um, uh, that's what we did. We followed uh, several previous animal research because it's a good guidance. And uh, uh, also used the trick by, by Albright, which says that oppo po po opposing motion um, um, clusters together. So we, we made virtual columns and parentheses. He actually, he drawed it like an ice cube, a perfect columnar model, which is not the reality, but, but it helps again to understand. This is the, the depths of the cortex. Here are the features. In this case, uh, uh, together, we looked this had one feature, that, that's why our feature get a bit big, because then we can detect them easier. So that means opposing motion, like horizontal, we call one axis of motion, opposing motion. So we have a stimulus going in this direction and another stimulus in this, but we pool the response to have this axis of motion, which gives us a bigger cluster. Same here, same here, and so on. So we get four axes of motion. And if we map that, we found here's one subject, you see uh, sampled MT with this grid technique, see two slices shown here now, and you see indeed we get different features here, that means the different colors shown here uh, correspond to interpolated four preferred axes of motion. And we get very nice maps which are not perfectly consistent but also not completely unrelated. We have now in a recent paper, which I come to later, uh, uh, tools developed how to calculate the columnarity of these data and, and come back to this. Um, uh, we also found tuning curves. That means if we look at patches for one X of motion and, and, and use part of the data to say these voxels are, are this kind of features, we test this in a machine learning way. We looked at in other runs, completely separate runs, and look, do the same voxels, get the same feature there. If we do this cross-validation, which is shown here by these uh, error bars, we see that we get perfectly reproducible results so that we get kind of not bimodal things or so, but usually uh, um, unimodal features so the voxels partition in these kind of uh, uh, preferences for axis of motion. And uh, uh, this is one experiment. I come to this back because I will uh, use it for studying higher cognitive phenomena in a moment. But now I give you another basic experiment in MT. Actually, uh, this was um, brought to me by Bill Newsom when I met him. When he saw this data I just showed you, he said to me, Rainer, you should go for disparity. You have even bigger clusters. 
said, oh, cool, I will try. So this is what we did with uh, um, my student Thomas Emmerling and, and colleagues. And what we did is we did an experiment following very precisely a classical monkey experiment by Newsom. And the idea here is to map this parity. That means if you uh, fixate, for example, here, then uh, you see things far away, uh, are protracted inside, and things closer to you are protracted outside. And th this parity you, you, you get helps you, your brain to kind of make out of from these two images a sweet a depths, a depths calculation, a stereoscopic depths. Uh, and this is how, how, how this, uh, simulating this. Uh, with a parallax, that means a jump between the two eyes, and you see basically how you can see more depths because of this, but this is now a dynamic version, but, but you do this all the time because you have two cameras which integrate from two different angles these two images. And you see you get this, by, by this uh, uh, depth effect much more information about the distance of objects, especially closer objects. And what they found in this, uh, the Angeles and Newsom study was, uh, again, a columnar uh, ideal model. Uh, of course, this is also um, beautifying the data. It's more conceptual work. But in principle, it, the data was consistent with that uh, model that, you, again, they found columns. Uh, but they found that you had not only direction of motion, which are the arrows here, but you see these bigger patches here, like the green for near and the red for far. And they replicate at some point also. And you see uh, uh, this is shown here. So we thought, can we do this with high field imaging using these kind of stimuli? Uh, we did it a little bit uh, different than, than Bill Newsom, but, uh, but very similar. For example, we had, again, also direction of motion, but we placed them in different depth planes. So you see the motion either, uh, so with, with binocular vision in the scanner, you see them either in a certain plane or behind the brain or in front of the brain, and, and, and each, each in two different depth levels to probe these kind of uh, uh, near and far clusters, actually. He did not stimulate close to the plane, so we had only near and far in two uh, uh, levels, as shown here, near, uh, near and far, um, and four axes of motion. So, so this is also interesting because we map conjunctively, because these stimuli all cross, we have 16 stimuli. So we map here at the same time the crossing of two qualia, also two features, uh, in the same area. How are these features co-represented? This is a very interesting question by itself. So we found, if only analyzing and pooling across direction of motion, we found in, in, in each subject, so each line is a different subject here, we found that indeed uh, we get a, a tuning uh, values from, from the voxels, and we found indeed that the, 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 the most uh, far and the most uh, near ones, but also the intermediate ones, showed a clear uh, uh, representation for the different depths level. And if we uh, look at these results, here they are split, they're not the conjunction analysis, which we uh, uh, still work on. But if you look here at a disparity, you see that looks a bit cluster-like, it's not perfect, but you see you have here the, 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 the red and the dark red for, for far, and the green and the dark green for near, and they group pretty nicely. Interestingly, this is these are the same voxel. If we now analyze from the same stimuli, the same voxels, but not for these features, but for the direction of motion features, we get these maps. And again, we get uh, here a yellowish one, bluish one goes about here, uh, and so on. It's not perfect, but we get basically two representations across the same voxels forming a map. So either the neurons somehow do this, or, I mean, this is an interesting thing. What calculations, what representations are calculated there to make these two interdigitated maps possible? This is something we currently think a lot about. Here's the same data for the disparity, just showing you again the logic. This is from the macaque monkey. This is the region we map with our high resolution technique. This is a volumetric plot, and the green and red shows us columnar like information. I, I use here only two levels, otherwise, it would be too, too closed. So it's just the, 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 the near and the far, not the very near and the very far. And if I plot these two in 3D at this kind of uh, 3D volume view of the cortex, the cortex is going downward. You see basically indeed that these uh, uh, look almost like, like columns. Of course, they're not perfect. Uh, uh, but uh, if we calculate a columnar index, that is uh, pretty obvious that this is following roughly the expected logic. But again, even if they would be completely round or kind of scattered around across depths, uh, as long as they are reliable, I'm, as a, um, from my question's point of view, I'm happy because I only want that I find reliable features at that resolution that I can really attribute uh, information to these features. Now I want to show you just very briefly uh, 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 an auditory excurs. First is here, um, if we 
use high field imaging just that you understand where, what, what benefit comes from that. Um, uh, if we, for example, map the inferior colliculus here, you see a full tonotopic map, what we showed before on the cortex, but now you can do this in the inferior colliculus or also the medial geniculate body. It's another paper by one of our colleagues. Uh, they, are, they are working in the group of uh, Leah Formisano. So she, uh, uh, Michelle Morel, she had just a paper showing this in the uh, uh, medial geniculate body. This is from Federico de Martino. He showed it here in the inferior colliculus. What I want to say is that this is so small, this is one voxel in three Tesla. It's one voxel. In high field imaging, it's a complete tonotopic map. It's just showing you what the gain is which we can have here. And I show you this in preparation of doing this in, in A1. Here we did a frequency mapping, a standard ton tonotopy. This is around Heschel's gyrus, and I reconstructed here the depth grids you see here. And then if we sample that uh, and make it flat, as I explained before, so, so superficial and deep layers, we see again that, and now comes an interesting thing, that not all the auditory secondary areas belt and surrounding the, the primary auditory cortex, but only, and this was a surprise to us, only in the kind of most proper definition of the auditory, uh, primary auditory cortex, A1, only there we found beautiful columnar-like structures. And this, uh, 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 but if you go outside, you find quite, quite a mess there. So it is not the case that each area must necessarily show, they show these features. So we could map frequency in all areas, but we could, cannot um, find always these vertical uh, structures. And that's good because if this technique establishes now, hopefully, and there are more and more labs doing this, Roger Tutela is just a nice paper out on, on, on columnar mapping. So this becomes a more standard technique. We can really use it and empirically go beyond the animal work and ask new questions how certain areas um, uh, are organized. Uh, just here also uh, that we go to multisensory cortex. We had the study with the vowels, uh, uh, um, uh, but also bimodal. So we presented, this goes back to, to uh, Ninke von, von Attefeld, he's a co-author also on this study, where we basically present uh, written uh, uh, vowels and also uh, um, uh, um, voice, of, uh, uh, speech sounds of these. And then we look how in the STS cortex, the visual, we present only visual, only auditory, or, or, or combined, either concurrent or inconcurrent. And we study, since many years, there are many papers about this, how these two streams of information are integrated in the STS, STG. And I show you here the first uh, results from our high field scans. And what we see is if we push the resolution, it's both 7T, but this is a lower 7T resolution. That's already close to a millimeter here. And what we see is that, that big clusters, which before was labeled as one cluster, suddenly break into finer clusters. Actually, there are some biases that, that, that because auditory dominates in the STS, you label easily, if you have big voxels, all voxels easier to auditory because there's the likelihood in a big voxel that you have auditory is much higher. So you actually have a very biased wrong view how STS is organized. If you increase the voxel resolution, your, your, your voxels more and more get driven from, say, one or a few of these uh, real clusters below. Uh, and then you see a more veridical resolution. And then also things like um, uh, the visual gets more prominent, which is weaker in the, these stimuli. Uh, uh, and also the, the multimodal ones in increase. And not only see we a, a change in topography, and more importantly, we see it in the functional data. And the same subject, the same scanner, just two different resolutions. We see a huge gain in sensitivity. That means we can separate uh, uh, sounds much easier in the high res because the data is much cleaner. So this responds either to visual, auditory, multimodal. It becomes super additive, which we haven't seen before in 3 Tesla. Uh, so, so that means the high resolution gives us really a separability and the, and the gain, which we, we also qu could quantify in, in, in our first subjects, that we get a, a higher um, 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 uh, selectivity for auditory, visual, and multisensory. So now I want to, in the remainder of my talk, uh, go to more cognitive tasks. Because uh, when we go to attention, um, perceptual um, switches, learning, and so on, we, of course, the end goal is then not to get these maps, but a, a more interesting goal is to use these maps and go beyond and look how features change their activity, again, dynamic, which I show you already today, but also in, in more classical learning over more elongated periods of time. So we had this debate about uh, uh, how fast can we count things as learning in the, in the very fast auditory nice data we have seen this morning. What I show you next counts actually also then as learning. 
um, so the point is what we do want to do now is if we understand the features and we can separate roughly the layers, we are in the possibility to use this, for example, if I see a certain brain area in one condition, mainly active here in the middle, I could kind of say this area is driven from bottom up areas because I don't see much feedback. If I see activity more in the upper layers, I get more top down feedback. So we can kind of try to um, uh, look not only which part is stimulated, but also what information is in these layers, which I will show you. The other idea is to, to look how dynamically these features change if attention or the uh, internal processes of the brain change. And I show you examples for both. The first is ambiguous stimuli, because that's a nice example, because the features shouldn't change, because the physical stimulus is constant. So you see here stimulus, and you might see this as two sliding cratings like this, is a plot stimulus, and it's ambiguous, so that means you can see it like this, but you can also fuse it and see it going upward, because uh, uh, we can actually influence that a bit, but we, in the scan up, uh, after doing some basic experiments, we adjust these, these intersection luminance here in a way that you either see them moving upward, or you should see, the, see two sliding left, right, the black one and the, and, the, and the bright one. So this is a stimulus which is ambiguous. So when I have the same stimulus into the brain and it switches, where is the switch happening? Where is it represented? What do I see? Do I see now this or do I see now that? And that's we hypothesized. If we have now the resolution to see these features, we might see these switches in the features so that maybe this feature, if you consciously perceive that, like stimulus is the same, but you consciously say, I see now this. Are then the features in your brain in MT uh, stronger active than if you say, I see that? Are then the features for vertical stronger active? So is this perceptual intrinsic private experience where the stimulus stays constant, can we explain it or can we relate it to the feature level in the brain? And that's exactly uh, uh, what we try to do. And um, uh, yeah, to make a long story short, we found this. It's not so easy because the horizontal features are more prominent than the vertical ones. It's not, not equal, but the blue are the horizontal ones. So the subject now says, I see horizontal motion. And you see the blue go up, some of the red. But you see now when the subject says, I see vertical motion, the blue go down and some of the red go up. It's of course not perfect. But you see, if we map the features, we see now reliable dynamic changes in these features related through the conscious percept of the subject. Another version is even simpler. We can uh, use physical stimuli to map uh, in the MT just horizontal and vertical direction of motion. If we have mapped that, we show you two, two stimuli, this is the so-called motion quartet, and you might see it like this, but you might also see it like that. It's again ambiguous. If it switches, it's in your brain. It's not the stimulus. Stimulus is constant. And the stimulus is devoid almost of, of anything because there is no motion. You have just two squares which blink either here or which blink here, but everything in between is not physically present. So the brain constructs the direction of motion and the brain uh, flips between two interpretations which are almost equally likely. And the nice thing is these switches occur not very fast, not like a Necker cube, so they need five to 10 seconds so that you can nicely study that in the MRI. So if we do that, we get exactly this. We get now for horizontal and vertical motion, the mapped features. So we see uh, 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 what, what, what is, which voxels are stronger for horizontal, which stronger for vertical. And then we see, and that's the nice thing, if the subject switches from one percept, which happens here at zero, to the other percept after the typical bold time of two, three uh, TRs here, these are, these are six seconds here, uh, four, six seconds, you see that indeed, the, this is the amplitude of the um, horizontal mapped features. They go up if you perceive horizontal coming from vertical and the other way around for the other features. So we basically get um, um, a, a marker of what is in my mind from how active these features are. We had this done before with a standard uh, uh, resolution. Then we only saw that when we see horizontal, there's more activity in the pooled MT and less if we have vertical, but we couldn't see the features. That was studied, uh, published 10 years ago. But now we see really the features inside the area. And we can also say, because the horizontal features are more prominent than the vertical one, this explains the pooled response we published 10 years ago, because you predict then that you get overall more activity for horizontal. So the future of this is to uh, uh, unravel unknown features. Of course, we, we did the simple thing in parentheses. It's difficult enough to get all these scanners work and the analysis, but uh, um, 
the difficult thing is we have to go to features we do not yet well understand. For example, here we, we used um, orientation and direction of motion and disparity, which are all features which are known exist in the areas we studied because they, they're inspired by animal research. And that's good because in the first phase, which I consider is now, we need to validate this, that we can do these things in the human. But I hope we go now in the next phase that we study areas where we have not a perfect homologue in the, in the, in the monkey. Uh, uh, already phase area might be very different because we see really different types of phases all the time. Um, uh, how is learning in these uh, features happening? So if I see horizontal the whole day, is the feature for horizontal stronger than the other one? I don't know. These are studies we can now try to do. Uh, uh, um, uh, but we need to go in other areas. Here's still the V, but, but I will learn on this. But we go now uh, currently uh, in some of these areas, Nico Kriegescord, and we work on FFA because he has a very nice theory that from prototypical retinotopic space, you get kind of a maps of phases in the phase area, which are still retinotopic, but with a uh, reference frame, which is the phase itself. And we, he hasn't seen it, but he has pooled sub inter subject data to give evidence for it. And now we do the studies on this high field to try to map the features of the phase and to relate his theory to that. I want to uh, um, uh, 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 end my talk with uh, one more experiment. So, so Sorry, for two experiments. So here's uh, an intentional experiment. It's the same columnar mapping in A1 I showed you before, but we did also there an auditory and a visual task because uh, they, they, they saw, um, um, uh, um, they, they, they heard sweeps up and down, like we heard this morning, but they also saw a visual stimulus and they could either attend to the visual stimulus or to the auditory sweeps. If they attended to the <laughs> auditory sweeps, we found that only the supracranular, so the, the upper layers, uh, 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 sharpened their tuning curves, so that means they prepared for better discriminability, so to speak. And this sharpening of tu tuning curves effect was uh, 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 not observed in the middle, granular, and, 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 and deep layers. It was unique for the upper layers. So this shows also that not only the horizontal information is interesting, but also the steps information. In a similar direction goes this study with my former student, which, which Brian briefly mentioned, Lars Muckley, where we basically um, 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 looked at a study he had done before, but now at ultra high field. And the study is very nice because he used decoding and presents full visual stimuli like these ones, like a, a car ride, a boat, and so on, uh, uh, and then uses the activity in V1 to decode from the activity what, uh, what the subject is seeing. And of course, then generalizes this to new uh, stimuli of these, uh, this kind when they are replicated. But the elegant part of the study is that he also occludes a quadrant like this one. That means we can now look in V1 to the area of V1, which is not stimulated, use the voxels from there, and try to predict this stimulus, so which stimulus you see. And of course, you could say this will not work because there is no activity in this part of V1. Why can you then decode it? But he showed in the first paper shown here, he showed that you can. You can decode what you see even if you use voxels in V1 which are not bottom-up stimulated. And he explained it, that could be that this part of V1, which looks not very active, but it could get top-down information, in the upper layers especially. And the idea is that this stimulus travels up the hierarchy, so, so here, this, this stimulus, and then you complete the stimulus in somewhere in the upper visual cortex, and you send a completed picture, to some extent completed picture downwards, and then here comes some, something which is specific to this or to this or to this, depending on what you see. And that information is good enough to predict what you see. But you must understand, this is a challenging task, because it was never trained with these images. So it's only trained with this one, and the test is then with the occluded one. And this works indeed. So if we now look here, this is now from, from um, white matter to peel surface. So these are the, the upper layers. So the red is when the stimulus is shown fully, and we see that many layers, but especially the middle layers, which get the input from LGN, they are the strongest in the sense of decoding. So they have the highest decoding accuracy. So they know what you see, these layers. If we now show this quadrant and only select the voxels here in this occluded part, then the uh, layers, inferior and middle layers, don't see anything, but the upper layers, show almost as good as in the full part what, you, what, what stimulus you perceive. And this is consistent across uh, the subjects. So it's a very strong effect. So it shows you again that this resolution, we can then investigate 
bottom up, top down, and separate it, although fMRI has not the temporal resolution to see these things, you have another way to separate bottom up from top down drive, and that can also help to build um, 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 uh, connectivity models in the sense of effective connectivity. And the final thing is, is uh, just a very briefly uh, a funny experiment um, which we just completed, where, where we used something which I have not the time to explain to you, but we, we, we work a lot also with neurofeedback. That is a type of learning which we study also as learning, where subjects in the scanner see um, 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 uh, the activity of their own brain in some regions, and they learn with their minds to do something so that the activity in certain areas change. This can be used even for clinical applications, as we have shown. We also use this to decode, um, to build decoders for people with motor impairments, like the lock-in syndrome, that they can use if EEG doesn't work, that they can use uh, uh, fMRI um, to, to communicate, to speak, just based on their brain activity. And why I'm showing you that is because uh, 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 on the 3T, this is a bit indirect. I'll show you what I mean by that. So here's the idea. When a subject wants to communicate a letter, the only way we can do this at a 3T at the moment is we let the subject do different tasks. Show this in a little animation. Um, um, the subject has to do like uh, reciting a poem or mentally drawing things or navigating through the house, things like that. So, so when the subject wants to say racehorse, so the R means inner speech, so it recites a poem. You see on the left side, on, on green is more language-related areas activated. We get this information, which has also temporal information, uh, slow temporal information. We get this, have a decoder, which tells us then automatically the subject wants to say R. Then the subject has to do the A, it's already gone, it was a motor task, motor imagery task, so the subject imagines drawing something, right, a figure. And then we get activity in another network, we, we can find it out, and now this must be an A. Because we encode here three different networks and uh, a, a temporal code uh, about when they have to do it, which I will not explain now. The important point is, while we have shown with many uh, subjects and even with first patients that this works very well, we get 100% accuracy actually, it is very unnatural that you have to recite a poem to say A, right? So therefore, what we now did with Seven Tesla is to go beyond this and develop BCIs which use the features. For example, you imagine in your mind that you see something moving left, right versus up, down. And these are only two choices, but we did it with four, and we can build a BCI based on the features in an area on 70. And even nicer is, is uh, the following study. Now comes the slide for Brian. Now I'm finally here, because this is Brain Voyager with a PIF mapping. And, and what, what, what I want to say here is that um, we use actually PIF mapping for the next experiment, but in a different way. So normally, uh, uh, as Brian uh, has shown you, you use, it, use PIF to have a better radiotopic mapping because you get not only the XY position of a receptive field, like shown here, but you also get the, the, the size of the receptive field. So, so therefore, you have more information and it's normally more robust. The other cool thing of that, it is an encoding model, which we use it for, and I show you this now, because we can inverse the process. For example, um, imagine, and imagine is now in a double sense, imagine someone imagines a letter. And what happens, according to the Mukli study, the higher area should produce somehow an image of a letter in V1. And we should be able to see it there uh, from the pure imagery and should get a visualization of the letter you imagine. Sounds a bit crazy, but it's exactly what we do, and we get first good results on 7T. So what you see here is you have the letters HTSC. We, we started with these four. Uh, and you basically... Uh, see, this is from perception. This is PIF inverted. So from the PIF map, we look at which voxels are active, look what model they encode for X, Y in the visual field and the receptor field size, add them up, convolve them, and then we get basically these views, which are looking very nicely like, of course, not perfect, but this is clearly more the H, more the T, more the S, more the C. And this is the perception. This has also been done by Pascal Gerven and, and, and Naimirin, so there are other work on this. But what has not been done is this for imagery. Because when you do this in three Tesla, you don't get good results. We tried. But on seven Tesla, it starts to work. It doesn't look as perfect, you see here. But you see, there is kind of an H when you see it. It's kind of a T. OK, the S is a bit difficult. And the C, you can see, is stronger here than here. But the, the good news is, on a single trial basis, when, when I imagine a letter and I correlate what, you, what we produce with the PIF inverse mapping with either the perception which we do before or with the letters themselves scaled in the right way, we tell the subjects where they should imagine the letter, 
we get a very high accuracy on decoding which letter you just imagine from the visual representation. So that shows, this is very, a very early study, it's not yet published, but it shows, we go further with that right now, it shows that in the future, at least with high field imaging, we might have BCIs, which are just built on imagining at least the letters and to read them then them out. And that is a, a very simple analysis. Although we used 0.8 millimeter, we have not done yet a laminar separation. I'm working now on doing the PAF at different depths levels. So that you have PAF at the lower, at the middle, at the upper, and then to see whether, like we saw with, with other studies, the upper layers are the worst usually because they, with the training veins, uh, change the image. So it might be we get even cleaner images when we also do this analysis, uh, restricting it, say, to the middle and, and lower layers. Yeah, in summary, uh, I just want to highlight that uh, I hope you have seen the potential of this approach for going into a new way of, of, of brain organization, which is beyond the areas and networks. It is more at the features and the layers, and it starts to get drive. So I see now uh, come papers out uh, at conferences, there are symposia and so on. So I hope this becomes really a, a, a new field. 70s pop up everywhere so that the people should have also the machines to do it. And I think it will help us to understand the brain better, but it will also help us to understand, hopefully, learning better, because when we understand and map the features in one individual, we can also track how these features change if the subject learns and get new data about learning with fMRI. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow.